Hi, everybody. Like, thanks for coming, like, uh, right after lunchtime. I know it's not that easy. You guys probably want to have rest and so on. But yeah, thank you very much for, for your time and coming here. So yeah, I'm going to speak uh, briefly about uh, detection of honeypots of, of the type of low and medium interaction. Um, who here like, has heard of honeypots before? Good, quite a lot of people. Uh, who is currently operating honeypot? Come on, people from Skirt, I know you're here. OK. Uh, <laughs> and uh, who is actually uh, operating a Kipo uh, or Kauri SSH honeypot? Oh, I probably detect your honeypots here on the way. So yeah, so briefly, who am I like about myself? Like I'm director of professional services at Blade Information Security. I've been around the security community for a while, like probably more years than I can remember. Uh, and I actually live in Krakow. Uh, and I pretty like it here pretty much. So here is like a briefly uh, roadmap about the presentation. So what's going to be discussed and what to expect from it. Um, we're going to start with a brief review of honeypots, uh, discuss a bit of the prior art. So I mean, what people has done before in terms of detection of honeypots. Uh, speak about also why are honeypots prone to detection. And we have a case study on detecting a popular SSH honeypot, that's namely Kipo and Kauri. And also about the experiment that I had of this internet-wide scanning of SSH honeypots, so like blowing the cover of a bunch of honeypots of people out there. Uh, and also the closing remarks about the presentation. So a brief review of honeypots. So honeypot like it simulates a real vulnerable system. Uh, I have like this asterisk here because sometimes it's actually a real system. It's not only just the, the simulation per se. And this concept is pretty old. It spans back from the from the eight is actually from this book of Clifford Stoll, uh, the Cuckoo's Egg, is uh, which is actually a must uh, must read uh, who, for whoever is interested in information security. Uh, and this is like considered like a pretty like important asset for those doing threat research and threat intelligence and so on. Because, well, a lot of people use honeypots to catch malware, to catch, um, like to do statistics on attacks and so on. Uh, and also it obviously helps to learn about tools, tactics, and procedures of an adversary. Uh, and actually lately, um, it's been gaining a lot of momentum because a lot of companies are actually offering some like commercial honeypot solutions in this so-called cyber deception technologies. Um, actually, just like another remark, so most of this presentation, like the content itself, it was actually done three years ago, but it was never really published. It was just published in, uh, in a small private conference. So this, like back then, this, there was no such thing as this cyber deception technologies. Or, I mean, obviously there was, but it was not as big as it's been uh, lately. So I'm um, talking about the different types of honeypots, so about the interaction levels. So we have like low, medium, and high interaction. And obviously, each of them have different advantages and disadvantages. And the focus of the presentation will be on the detection of medium interaction honeypots. Um, low interaction honeypots, they are just way too easy to detect, really. It's not even worth like the, the time. Uh, so I decided to actually focus, to have like a special focus on the detection of media interaction ones. So the low interaction level, it provides this very basic functionality to enumerate a service. Um, so for example, uh, there is this spam pot that's like the, there in the bottom. So it just, it emulates uh, a vulnerable um, SMTP service but it has only very, very basic, very raw functionalities, which means that anything that goes um, a bit above, like a bit beyond, sorry, uh, what the, the normal cycle of connecting to SMTP, authenticating and sending the email, it just doesn't implement. So it means that it's just like super duper easy to detect because pretty much every other functionality is just missing. So it usually it's done just to detect something very, very specific um, and yeah, like, I think it's not very popular these days. Uh, at least, again, like, when it's only for something specific. But if you want to actually get there more information, you better use something else. Uh, th there is the medium interaction honeypots. The, it has this enhanced interaction. So, and it's also pretty popular with the threat research community. Uh, the there is a 
pretty low barrier of entry and also low maintenance. And examples like Kipo carry uh, Compot. Compot is like a SCADA one that it uh, kind of emulates a nuclear plant kind of thing and so on. And people uh, use this to lure attackers in uh, to try to attempt well, like different attacks and try to observe it. And high interaction honeypots, they are usually fully functioning systems uh, with uh, like extra logging or instrumentation capabilities to actually gather information. Uh, and advantage, like you can use it to the discover unknown vulnerabilities because, well, it's a real system, so people might use an actual zero day to try to, to pop your your box there. Uh, but uh, there is also one, this is one of the disadvantages. Like, uh, first of all, like the, there's a very high maintenance cost because it's an actual machine. Uh, and also the compromised host can be used to attack others. So it's obviously a good idea to actually isolate this from a firewall perspective and so on out of your network and so on. Um, and th this actually, this example, like uh, people I think these days use more these custom VMs uh, and send different sensors uh, to, to collect logs. But a long time ago, there was SEBEC. It was like an LKM for, for Linux that also got uh, a lot of instrumentation, uh, I mean, performed this sort of instrumentation in the kernel to collect uh, all this data later. Um, there was all obviously uh, some previous work on honeypot detection, because especially because I think uh, it started gaining momentum with the honeypot project and so on around early 2000s like uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And obviously, this attracted um, the interest of the the computer security community, well, like the offensive security community and, and some black hats as well, to know if, well, if they're actually being trapped or not. Uh, so obviously, yes, there was prior art on this subject. Uh, and I, when I was doing this research, I found a lot of academic work using like support vector machines and like and a bunch of other things that I don't know. Maybe I'm too dumb, or but those this thing just just didn't look practical. Uh, and back then, like in the early 2000s, as I said, like most of it was actually revolving around the detection of virtual machines. But well, we are not in 2002 anymore. Like just detecting that you're inside a virtual machine is not a reliable indicator that it's a honeypot these days. Uh, and this one, Sebek, it even sounds Polish, right? Sebek. Um, it was detected in evading the fake uh, version of FRAC, 63 and 62. Uh, and also, like other people, like for example, Joe Oberheide and this guy, Manish Career, they wrote a paper like detecting Honey D, and I think it was around 2006. So uh, since then, so we're talking about like a gap of some 10 years or so that people haven't done any sort of work in detecting, detecting honeypots, or if they're doing, uh, they're not really publishing or it didn't really get uh, much publicity. Uh, also, this guy from Rapid7 and Andrew Morris, they did some work in detecting uh, Kipo from a pre-authenticated perspective. Like, Kipo is one of the objectives of our detection um, here in, in this presentation. Uh, and also, these techniques, they were made public and they were patched. Uh, so I'm expecting, actually, the same techniques that are going to be described here to be patched in the near future. Um, but yeah, but there's plenty of others, like it's easy to, to find, seriously. Um, and the most of the detection techniques for for like the SSH honeypots, they actually rely on the post authentication, which means that you actually have to be lured inside the trap already. And then when you're interacting with the system, you're gonna tell that, oh, this is not real, real system because lots of functionalities are missing and so on. So the idea here is actually to detect it from a completely pure authenticated perspective, which means that we're going to not even fall inside the trap and tell from, like, before connecting or authenticating to the service that that thing is a honeypot. Uh, also, this guy, Darren Martin, that was, like, one of the guys from LowSec, by the way, uh, he found, uh, like, a few ways to detect compot honeypot, and this was introduced into Shodan. Uh, there is this service of Shodan called HoneyScore, that you type the IP address and you say, oh, this is like a, like a SCADA honeypot or something. So why are they detection prone? So the low and medium interaction, they are nowhere close to emulate of a full, like real target system. And they have like lots of incomplete features, as I said. So this is why it's pretty easy. Like as soon as you're there, you just can can tell immediately that thing is also, uh, I mean, it's not a real system. And also there is, for example, some, the, some of the implementation are not compliant with the RFCs, for example, 
and so on. So there are different ways to tell uh, that, again, like some functionalities that will behave in a certain way in a real system, and when you try against these, uh, well, these emulated ones, they just don't, uh, they behave differently or they don't even have these features. Uh, and the high interaction like is significantly harder to detect. Uh, again, like in 2002 or something, people were detecting, oh, inside the virtual machine, this is a honeypot. Well, not really the case these days, especially where everything's virtualized, everything is on the cloud, and so on. But still, they're prone to detection, like Sebek. There were like a couple of different ways uh, that people use to, to detect the, its presence in the system. Uh, but then again, well, the maintenance is pretty high, so I think this is one of the reasons that people like a lot to use this uh, low, sorry, the medium interaction ones. And go, let's go to the case study. So, like carrying people, like are like the most uh, say popular SSH honeypots uh, these days. And well, the emulated shell for starter, it doesn't really provide uh, a very complete bash terminal. And then many commands are also missing. So once you're inside, as I said, like it's pretty easy to detect. Um, but then also like it's not super difficult to detect before you fall into the trap. So this is actually the inside the shell of a real Linux system. This is just this for loop in back. Uh, it will say like this is like a echo. Is this real? Like three, three times doing this loop. But when you try this inside an SSH honeypot this thing just like command not found. So it means that like it didn't really implement some functionalities from Bash. But then it's not really our objective for the presentation. Like we want to detect it from even before getting there. So the basic idea was actually to understand the behavior of OpenSSH and, and the behavior of Keep and Carry from a pre-authenticator perspective. So in pre-authentication, what do we have? We have a uh, Cypher suite advertisement, uh, banner advertisement, um, compression algorithms, and so on. So basically, the whole key exchange uh, and the, the initial handshake. And the idea is to see how it will react to different handshakes in the OpenSSH and in honeypots and take notes of these differences so we can uh, do this like without uh, wasting time, like brute forcing passwords and so on for a system that's fake. So this is like some of the pre-authentication, uh, pre-authenticated detection techniques. Uh, I listed four of them here, but uh, there are plenty of more if you spend some time looking at it. Uh, there is a bad version. Uh, so essentially, when you uh, a SSH client advertise itself to to the server, it says like SSH uh, dash two uh, dot o dash OpenSSH blah blah the version uh, of the banner of the client. So in, in Curry and Kipo, whenever it sees of SSH version that's not either 1.99 or 2, which are the only SSH versions that are actually standardized, uh, Kipo will throw this bad version error, whereas OpenSSH will throw something else. So I think it's like protocol mismatch, or it's like protocol major differences, like something like that. So it definitely throws a very different error that you can tell that thing is not uh, an OpenSSH as it claims to be. There is also this double banner. So when you send the banner twice, like you send the banner and then a carrier actually return line feed the banner again, OpenSSH will just ignore the last banner and they'll find it will proceed with the whole key exchange thing. Whereas it would just throw, uh, when it comes to carry and Kipo, it would just throw like a packet corrupt error. So again, another way to detect it. There is this, this one is really funny. When you send like eight carriers returned like with nothing else, um, again, OpenSSH will respond like actually fine. Uh, and then the other one will throw over this packet corrupt or protocol mismatch error. And also fuzzy key exchange. So some of the, in this initial key exchange, as I said, like with the, the whole thing with advertisement of the Cypher suites and the compression algorithms, um, if you get even that fuzzer that comes with the Metasploit of key exchange, if you throw it against uh, OpenSSH, it will not break. Whereas if you throw it against Curry and Kipo, uh, which, by the way, it under the hood uses uh, twisted, twisted matrix, you know, like Python twisted uh, for its uh, SSH servers, it throws like thousands of, of different exceptions. 
So you can tell that some of these fuzzed key exchanges, when you try them against SSH, SSH just sometimes gives an error, but it's a very robust error and gives back like a message, like kind of, hey, like protocol mismatch or something. Whereas the other one just crashes big time and nothing comes back. So you can tell uh, there is not an open SSH as it was advertising. So here's just like some code. Like I think it's very bad to read. I'm sorry, but you guys will be able to see this in the slides. But if you see here, like in this blue thing that I made a circle, it even says like RFC section, blah, blah, blah ask for strict uh, carriage return line feed. We are more relaxed. So it says like it's not even super confined with RFC. So also these differences you can tell, uh, you can tell apart from uh, OpenSSH and, and these honeypot ones. Um, this is what I was just saying about the bad version. So, sorry, uh, yeah. And also here, uh, it will say like, oh, bad version and so on. When the when this line here, like this for loop and these conditions are not satisfied, it will throw this bad version error. Whereas here, it will throw something else, saying protocol measures different. And this is also like pretty bad to read, sorry for that. But this is the, the key exchange procedure of Twisted. And if you see, there is no such thing as a try accept or any sort of try catch, like nothing. So it, that's why it crashes big time with these unhandled exceptions. Um, there is this, like, an, uh, again, like an example of this. Uh, by the way, this host, like honeypot.whatever.io, is my server. And it's going to be there for like the next week. So you guys can actually try uh, by yourselves. Uh, with like all these all these techniques here being described. So in the first one, you can see here like uh, the port 22 is actually uh, open SSH, the real one. Uh, and whenever you say this SSH, this bad version, you would just say like protocol mismatch, whereas the other one would give these bad version errors as we just mentioned. Uh, and now for like a quick live demo, actually it's not quite live because I don't have internet here, but I have a video. Um, Oh no, actually, I do have internet. Yeah, I do have. So, is it good to read? It's quite bad now. Uh, maybe the video will be better. Yeah. So, here we are using this script that, uh, that I published today, uh, actually, um, to detect curry people. Uh, against the actual OpenSSH server. And if you see here, like it tests like some of these techniques we just mentioned, uh, and it will say, oh, this is not a honeypot. But when you try against port 2022, it says, yes, like it, it's a trap, it's a honeypot. Uh, I think 2022 is curry and the other one is Kipo, like the choo 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 choo. Like same story, like it's definitely a Kipo honeypot because you use some of these techniques uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, but then again, it's super easy to find different ones and create your own probes for that. Oh, let's go back. All right, so um, I also like some uh, some false positives actually when with some of these techniques because some misconfigured OpenSSH server, especially there is a version of 5.3 or something, that it keeps throwing these packet corrupt errors, and I actually don't know don't know why. And the script that I just released that I mean just showed you guys and was released today on GitHub, uh, it uh, uses these different techniques and gives a score. Uh, depending on which uh, response comes back. And then if the score is higher than two, we consider this as a honeypot. We have this certainty of like a degree of confidence that this thing is honeypot. So then obviously I decided to do like internet wide scanning to find them all. And the objective is like to map the entire internet for to find them to find also a suitable tool to allow us to do internet-wide scanning uh, and plot them in a map for visualization purposes because like, it's just much cooler to actually have, the, like, have this visualization of this whole thing. And finally, we'll detect all the things that was the final goal. 
And uh, here's like a brief explanation using mass scan for our goals. Like I'm sure that you guys are familiar with mass scan. Mass scan is like the sports scanner that like you can do internet wide scans in just a couple of hours. Um, and it also has a great feature that it detects banners. Uh, that also it has a ba uh, this uh, little known feature that it's possible to actually send some sort of payload. It's called hello string here in base64. So whenever you connect into something, you can send like some sort of payload and get the whatever response back. Uh, however, the banner grabbing functionality of mass scan, well, it does what it's supposed to do, like to do a banner grabbing. So it does a parsing of the banner. So whenever it sees uh, a response that comes SSH one point something or SSH two point something, it will get only that banner and whatever comes after the carry actually return in line feed, it would just ignore. So it would doing the proper parsing of the banner. But then again, if you remember correctly, in our in our uh, detection probes, we need not only this response, but also whatever comes later, saying like an error or something like this. So it means that we have to do some sort of modification in, in mass scanner. Uh, so I just, uh, this was actually probably the, the least elegant way possible to do this. But they just kind of corrupted like my scanner in the sense that whenever it sees uh, SSH 1.2 or 1. Point, uh, sorry 1.0 or 2.0, uh, it will trigger this parser, right? That we only get the banner and ignore everything else. So I just corrupted it instead of like I just changed it to H and P, so it would never see this, which means that it will get not only what comes there and whatever also information because that's what we needed. So I'm sure there was a much better way to do this, but this was like just like the, the crappy way that I, that I found to do. And it turns out that it works. So that's actually what I wanted. So uh, notes about the experiment. Like I got the VPS with DigitalOcean, like one of the pretty cheap VPS. It took like on average some 20 hours to scan the entire internet for honeypots. Uh, and the logs had like around some 900 megs, so it means that like all these five dollar cheap VPSs, they will do the job quite well. But then, really, be prepared to handle those of abuse complaints per day. But like too many of them, I used to get. Uh, it turns out that spam house and all these people, they apparently don't know how to differentiate just a simple TCP connect uh, to port 22 from an actual active brute force. So I was always responding and putting like in the end, say, oh, I'm just doing some research and so on. And after actually a month of getting complaints every single day, they just decided to freeze my VPS. Um, but yeah, but, but at least I got the results I wanted. But so I recommend doing this if you want to do some of your experiment, but be prepared. You might gonna get kicked out from DigitalOcean. Uh, so the methodology was like to mask and ports 20, uh, two zero two 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 with the, these detection strings that we, that we just uh, talked before. Triage these results, uh, and as I said, like some of them have this pattern of like, oh, sorry, this packet corrupt thing that it was not a very reliable indicator. So which means that all of these that had these problems, I was passing them through in my s detection script. So and then plotting everything in a map just to look cool. Uh, and well, I'm sorry, like apparently it's not that great to read to see the the map. But this is like the, the mapping of some of the, the honey pots that were detected. Uh, so these are the results. But it was very funny. Like they had a very unexpected result when I was doing this uh, this whole scannings and so on. And it's still like I'm not sure if this was like an elaborate joke or somebody really screwed up their job. So when I was scanning the whole internet, like there was this very funny banner that appeared. If you guys can see, it's called GCHQ Honeypot 34 and GCHQ Honeypot 12. Uh, and GCHQ is like, for those who don't know, is like the, the equivalent of the NSA in Britain. Uh, and obviously the IP addresses are redacted here. Uh, but if you get them, put them in MaxMind, you're gonna see that they are from United Kingdom. This is the coordinates, uh, the accuracy radius. And if you put this in Google Maps, it's actually very close to MI5, the security service of Britain. And then if you go to the website of MI5, this is like, we work very closely with this GCHQ. 
So I don't know really if this was just like a very, very elaborate joke or if somebody just in GCHQ just doesn't know how to configure their own honeypots. Uh, and closing remarks, it's just like uh, they're very valuable tools, definitely. Uh, I'm not against them. But uh, if you're doing threat research, uh, bear in mind that they are very, very easy to be detected. Um, and then this whole thing of detection, it's going to be like really a cat and mouse game. It's like an arms race. Because as I said before, like some of these techniques for detecting people, they were released and then guys, some people just came patched. Uh, most likely they're going to patch some of these techniques that uh, are made, being made public today. Um, but then uh, if you're interested, you can just find your own as well and do the scanning again. You, there will always be a way to detect at least these media interaction honeypots for sure. Uh, and also, if you're a threat researcher, if you're solely relying on this for your intelligence, you're pretty much screwed because this doesn't really provide a very reliable uh, indicator like against like an uh, actual the determined adversary. Uh, and then a high interaction on honeypot will most likely yield like much better results, but it comes with a cost, especially of maintenance. And yeah, the scripts and supporting material can all be found in our uh, GitHub repository. And that's all that I have for today. So thank you very much for coming. Uh. So I think it's like question time now. I don't have much experience with honeypots, so my question may be a bit silly, but I just wanted to ask, to what's the main advantage of these high-level honeypots frameworks you mentioned in comparison to the mm -hmm. custom uh, virtual machines uh, set up with the extensive logging, for example, mm -hmm. to some external network device or like custom setup? Is, is it all about the simplicity of the setup or Something more. Well, I think like mostly about the simplicity of setup, for sure. I think that will be, uh, but also like, uh, don't get me wrong. I also don't have much experience with honeypots. I just want to detect them, and like, and sh like, just like to fuck around with somebody's day. That's it. But I don't. I actually don't operate them. I. I mean, I do like until next week, so you guys can actually play with what was there. But uh, it's not really my field. I'm like penetration testing and so on. Uh, but yeah, I think like mostly the the simplicity of, of this whole thing. Okay. Thanks. So no other questions, so thank you.